It's my great pleasure to introduce again our next speaker, um, is Associate Professor Leanne Kutcher. Um, Leanne is the Associate Dean of Resourcing and Director of the Organisational Discourse Strategy and Change Group at the University of Sydney which uh, Business School, which sounds an exciting and demanding role. Her research explores the impact of management strategies and discourse on diversity, equity and inclusion for organisations, the people um, who work in them and the wider community generally. Her research has been published extensively in peer-reviewed journals, in organisational studies, journal of management studies, work employment and society and gender, work and organisation and she's also been widely disseminated throughout social media including The Conversation, The Sydney Morning Herald, ABC Radio and television generally. Um, if we could welcome to the stage uh, Associate Professor Leanne Kutcher. It's great to get invited to talk to different groups of people about your work, particularly when you're an organisation studies scholar, because that's what I do. I go into different organisations and I talk to people about their work. Um, less of that lately since I became an associate dean, when I'm actually someone now who's in a management role, so I find myself in that strange position of doing the things that I used to tell other people how to do, and now I've got to do it. And it's a lot harder, isn't it? So uh, that's my experience at the moment. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is some work that we did with some engineering colleagues. So, you know, I leave it to you to decide whether it's got applicability for the nursing situation I, and hospital teams, but I'd, I'd, I think that it probably does. And the other thing I'd like to say is um, I'm talking about age. But we could be talking about any kind of diversity really here. So I just, I, that sort of occurred to me when I was sitting there listening to other fascinating talks. So just also keep that in mind. Um, so generations, okay, everybody's talking about them all the time. You know, there's even television shows talking about my generation. Uh, everybody in this room will know, without me having to, uh, to, to tell them, whether they're a baby boomer, whether they're a Gen X, whether they're a millennial. Uh, this, this sort of categorization of people, which used to only happen in marketing, because uh, it helped them to sell stuff to people, is kind of happening everywhere now. And there are a lot of management consultants out there who are making money out of this uh, and talking about particularly how to manage millennials. Uh, poor old millennials, they get a really hard time, actually. Uh, but, you know, I just did a quick, you know, so I was thinking, you've just got to have some nice slides when you talk. Uh, I did a quick Google search, and these are the kind of images that come up. Uh, and the words, you know, millennials, they're spoiled, they're lazy, they're entitled. There's books like, you know, not everybody gets a trophy. Uh, you know, and that's a bit unfair because, you know, the baby boomer parents insisted they all got trophies when they were at school. Um, so, and then there's the Gen Xs who are kind of like busy having careers and being mums and dads and aunties and uncles, whatever. And that, nobody talks about them very much and they don't talk about themselves very much. And that's pretty obvious why, because they're so busy. They haven't got time to think about what they're like. They're just sort of getting on with it. And then if you look for images of baby boomers, of which I'm one, um, Apparently we just spend a lot of time having fun and drinking, and we're all white and we all have nice teeth. Um, so, you know, it's, it's kind of, there's, there's, it's interesting all these images. But, you know, really what's happening with these generational classifications is that they're just, they're straight jackets. They're just straight jackets for people, and they're straight jackets for managers who are trying to manage diverse teams. So that's my first, you know, really I think important point. If we focus on chronological age, uh, we get ourselves into a lot of trouble. And that's what these generations are all about. We should be thinking about variety within generations. I mean, of course there are generations, and generations share experiences. You know, generations have had experiences of the labour market. You know, when I left school, there were heaps of jobs. You know, kids, kids that I'm teaching now coming out are facing a different time. Sure, some things apply to generations, but people are really different within generations. It's sort of an obvious thing, but these stereotypes are very powerful. And the literature tells us that, you know, younger people are often described as, and younger people are basically just people that are younger than you, are self-centred, narcissistic, cynical, individualistic, self-serving, and a lot worse. Uh, and older employees are often seen as being rigid, technically unsavvy, um, 
not open to change, apparently need a lot of routine. They don't like it when things happen differently. The other interesting thing to note about age, unlike the other diversity characteristics, is you know, hopefully we will all age because you know, there's only other one. I don't have to tell you more than anybody what the other option is. So really, the, the sort of things that we say now will one day be maybe said about us. And the other thing about age, which I find interesting, is that these kind of things that we say about different ages, we could never, ever, out loud, say that about any other diversity category now. So age is kind of a little bit behind the eight ball uh, in that way. There's a lot of age discrimination uh, inside organisations. It's you know other work that I've done. It's really hard to get a job if you find yourself outside the labour market after you're at the age of 50. Inside organisations, people are being told to manage by generations. So chronological age is really kind of not helping us. It's not helping us uh, at all. So what we want to argue in our work is that you know really. Um, you know, age shouldn't matter. So the best teams we found in our research, the best teams, the most innovative teams, the most productive teams were teams where age uh, didn't matter. Um, now, I'm not talking here about diversity for its own sake. What I'm talking, and I'm not talking about that you don't recognise that there are people in the team who've got more experience, people who are younger, but what I'm saying is putting age to the forefront and thinking about it, uh, as some people do in some organisations, is really totally uh, counterproductive. And what we need to do is we need to challenge hierarchical career structures. Um, and that's harder in some organisational contexts, I appreciate, than others, and maybe harder uh, in the medical uh, situation. Um, and also this idea of time serve cultures. We need to sort of move ourselves away from those. This is what our research shows if we want to create innovative, you know, an innovative workplace culture, which is just a, a, a clever way of saying be open to new ways of doing things. So age doesn't matter unless you're a cheese. So I'm sure no one here in the room is aspiring to be a cheese. So, you know. So what do we do? So we've we got a big a, uh, Australian Research Council grant to do uh, to look at the way in, in which age is managed. We've done it in a lot of different organisations. Well, the one I want to talk to you about today is a big global engineering firm. So the global engineering firm had two divisions that we worked with. One was a water division, which we called Neptune. We're clever, aren't we? And the other is a health division. We called them Salus, because uh, Salus, I don't know if you know this, is the goddess of health. So that's how I'm going to talk about them today, because I can't, I can't tell you who they actually are. Now, we, we went into these organisations, we talked to people today in different teams, different ages, and we were really struck by how different these two divisions of this one uh, firm were. And we found, um, and today I want to talk to you about the, the differences and the differences in practices that we've grouped in these three categories, mutuality, variety, and, cap and capacity. Um, academics have to do this sort of stuff, you know, put things in neat little categories, but it can be, it can be useful. So just want to look at each of these in turn. Um, so what do we mean when we talk about mutuality? Well, here we're talking about um, where older and younger employees in the team were both recognised for what they brought to the team. So they were recognised for having different cap capacities. This was in the, in the SALUS, which was the health division, which was the one that was the really effective, innovative division. And interestingly, Neptune, uh, about a year after we did our research, uh, the parent company uh, sold this company. I don't think it's just because of the way they were doing their age diversity, but you know they were, they had been a real market leader, and they were no longer. So that's in, that's important to know about them. So different people, mutuality. So differences in mutuality. So in Salus, people, the way they talked about themselves as an older or younger person was really positive, and the way in which they talked about their colleagues who were either older or younger was also really positive. So this positive self-talk and positive, positive othering talk. And in Neptune, it was striking how negative the talk about not only themselves and the limitations they placed on themselves, but also particularly the younger colleagues was absolutely, well, to my mind, gobsmacking. Because to be honest, when I went in there, I thought it would be the opposite. I thought it would be the younger people in the teams who'd be saying, oh, you know, she, she's just so bad on the, 
on the technology. She's got no idea what she's doing. Uh, but we didn't find that. We actually found things like people saying, well, you know, they don't know what, they think they know everything. They, they haven't got a clue. You just have to drop them in the deep end and hope they'll swim. And they were really, really quite disparaging, particularly of the younger colleagues. So this really didn't create an environment in which ideas were shared, in which people supported one another, which for what Kim was saying about resilience uh, is such an important uh, team dynamic. So the other thing that happens there is the way in which we talk about each other means that we also shape how, what that person brings to the team. So it's not just about uh, you know, whether you, you know, like them or not. It's much more than that. It's about whether you're prepared to recognise uh, their experience and their ideas and the things that they bring. So because there was a lot of negative self-talk in Neptune about younger people, when they brought new ideas to the table, they were just completely disregarded. You know, we've tried that, we've done that, it doesn't work. Uh, whereas in Salas, there was an openness to that. And it doesn't mean that if a young person brings a stupid idea, you have to say, well, that's a really great idea. But you can do it in a way that's respectful of their, the fact that they're trying to bring uh, new ideas to the team and new ideas and new, new ways of doing things. The second thing was variety. So really, in order for the teams to be really innovative, they had to be able to be adaptive. And that meant they had to engage in a variety of different kinds of practices. Now. How is that, what's age got to do with this? Well, it was really relevant in the, in the sense that, okay, so in Neptune, there was only one past that mattered, and that was the past when there'd been a really highly effective and innovative organisation, when it was young, and also the people who are now old in the organisation was young, that was when it was really great. Things were really great around here then, and there was a lot of nostalgia, and that meant that anybody, whether they were a new, a young person or an older person who was new to the organisation, anything they'd done didn't count. It was only what had happened before in the team, in the organisation, in that particular place that actually mattered. Whereas in Salas, you could come and bring a whole range of different experiences and they could be recognised from different pasts, from different things that you'd done. And I think this has got really important implications, not just for age, but also for um, other identity categories like gender. For example, if you're a woman who's been out of the workforce for a while, you may have been doing lots of different things, learning skills that are going to make you more resilient, for example. They should be recognised as important when they're brought to the team. Um, so that was this this kind of recognition of that created a whole lot of variety in the practices in the ways that they did things uh, within these teams. Because you can imagine, if all you're doing is thinking about the ways we've always done things around here, then that's all you're going to do. Keep on doing the way we've always done things around here. And then the third one is capacity. So. Being able to recognise a range of capacities, a range of experiences, as I've said, but also, more than that, being willing to share them with other people. So what happened in the organisation Neptune, not only did they say, oh, young people don't know what they don't know, well, the obvious thing to say to them is, well, you should tell them, you should show them, you should share with them, um, but they didn't. Um, now, it's not all the individual's fault, there was an organisational culture that didn't create that there weren't reward systems in place to encourage people to share. So what we found in other organisational contexts is, you know, older people in teams have so much to share. They, they don't even know how much they've got to share. But organisations don't create incentive structures, performance review structures that allow for that recognition. So they only want to reward people who are constantly wanting to move up. And people who are saying, look, I'm really happy being this team member, giving back to everybody. Nobody, you know, managers would say to us, the organisation doesn't give me the capacity to recognise that and reward that. So we have to sort of start doing that. We have to really um, encourage people to be knowledge sharers. Now, interestingly, a recent article in the Academy of Management, Learning and Education said, and it's really important, the other thing to recognise is it's not just older people who've got knowledge and can share, it's also younger people. And so this two-way sharing is really important. And it's not just sort of like, I'm older and I've got all this knowledge, I'm going to share it with you. It's, kind of, it's, got to be, it's got to be back and forth, it's got to be iterative and it's got to be ongoing. And of course, you know, when Kim was talking, I was thinking, well, that could be around resilience. That could be around, you know, this experience has happened to me and this is what I learned from it, and I'm sharing it with you. 
So that's really important. And the other important thing is to allow people to be able to move about in teams, move up and down, without that being seen as somehow a punishment. Um, and getting away from ideas of linear career structures uh, is really important to this kind of capacity building uh, in organisations. So let's have a bit of a quick... Oh, that's, I didn't have that up that whole time. I was supposed to have that there. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> OK. So let's think about what was good to do, what's good to do. You know, what are the takeaways? What's good to do? So don't engage in stereotyping. You know, don't do it about yourself either. We're always making jokes about ourselves, particularly, you know, older people. And don't, you know, don't just think about, just think before you say it, check yourself. Be open to different paths, different ways of, you know, being in the world. Um, Recognise opportunity-based experience, which is really important because experience is, is often about time served but it isn't only that, and that's really important. Be prepared to try new ways of doing things. And this idea that we thought, so the thing we tried to sort of come up with a category that the, the kind of management we saw at Salas, and it was management by stretching. It was giving people new opportunities, like giving younger people in the team new opportunities, supporting them for a while, and then saying to them, you're fine now, off you go. And uh, also, lots of much older people in the team, like people over 60, who were giving the opportunity to work on brand new projects. Like, they weren't being, you know, sent to do the filing or, you know, I don't know what happens in nursing, dispensing, you know, measuring out the drugs or whatever. They were actually given fantastic new opportunities and they were so excited for that and they were so up for it and they were so capable. So what don't you do? You don't engage in negative stereotyping. You don't romanticise the past and live in a past where it's always better. The past is always better for older people. So. Times, <laughs> you don't have a time served view of experience. You know, you sort of don't think, well, you couldn't possibly know that because you're, you know, you've only been here for five minutes. What would you know? Um, and don't focus on routines, although I appreciate there, <laughs> there are times when you really need routines, and I'm sure in hospital settings that's particularly important. And don't hoard your, value, your valued competencies. Like, they're only valued if you hoard them, they're only valued by you. If you share them, they can be valued by everybody. And what we found at Neptune was it really was about management, what we call management by containment. So I don't know how I'm going for time, but I hope I'm not going too over my, um, this is my last slide. Um, so I want us to shift the mindset away from a time served approach to recognise that people of all ages and all tenures can bring experience to a role. And I want you to think about how you as a team leader can kind of engage in that stretch management, looking for new opportunities for people. Uh, rather than limiting them by age, like, so age shouldn't matter. I want us to think about removing caps and impediments around organisational movement and making it easier for staff to advance by getting new opportunities, but also for people being able to say, I'm happy where I am and this is how I feel I can keep contributing. Or I really, you know, just because I'm older doesn't mean I don't want this great new next opportunity. Uh, so that's really important because at all stages of our life, we want to pull in, give more, pull back. We've got other stuff going on in our lives. So that's not just about age, I think. That's just about a kind of flexibility in organisations. But that isn't just about what suits the organisation. Um, and thirdly, just this idea that we can engage in this intergenerational mentoring, that really, as this uh, big study in the Academy of Management and Learning said, you know, they were working with automobiles, uh, automobile industry, um, really, younger and older people can be experts in their field. Older people can be novices. There's things they've never done before they don't know about, and younger people can be experts, and, of course, vice versa. So, as I said before, I think these findings, you know, have applicability for all forms of identity categories, whether it's different professions working together, recognising that people from all professions have things to bring, have knowledge, have different paths, whether it's about people of different genders, different races, different tenures uh, within the organisation. But I think, you know, there's a recent Harvard Business a Review article which actually talks about how diverse teams work better because everybody's slightly uncomfortable. <laughs> everybody's not really sure about that other person because they're not just like them, uh, which is one interesting way of thinking about this. But it also means that people sort of think, OK, but what actually happens is people bring new ways of thinking and new ways of, of engaging, and you don't get that really toxic uh, group think, which happens a lot uh, in organisations when everybody is moving and thinking and working in the same way. But, you know, diversity is not a panacea, is it? Um, in and of itself, 
The Neptune had really diverse teams, age diverse teams, the same diversity that Salus had. So it's not just diversity in teams for in and of itself. It's really about when people feel welcomed and respected in the teams, and when people feel that they've got something unique that they can contribute. And that'll only happen when we stop thinking about generations and putting people in little categories and boxes. And it'll also only happen when we stop thinking that diversity is important in and of itself, and we start thinking more about what are the outcomes from diversity. And our study shows that th those outcomes can be around creativity, they can be around some deeper thinking within the team, and that leads to new ways of doing things, uh, which, we, which we call innovation. Um, so thanks so much for the time to talk to you today, and I hope you can take something away from that context uh, to your own context. So thank you.